Before I introduce Ken Van Horn, today's speaker, I, I want to say a few uh, quick announcements. So, um, March 30th, Ducks Unlimited Student Banquet. Um, still some tickets left, obviously. And I strongly encourage everyone's attendance. Uh, one more presentation will be two weeks from tonight. Uh, Dr. Rick Kaminsky from Clemson University will be uh, putting the capstone keynote presentation on our, on our speaker series. And really excited to host him. Um, and one announcement about that presentation, we're not going to have a, a, um, any refreshments that, that night because of the banquet. So we encourage you, if you want refreshments, go right over to the Moose Lodge. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do refreshments there that night. So Kaminsky's presentation right into the DU banquet. So, OK. Well, with that, we'll get moving here. I'll introduce Mr. Ken Van Horn. The former migratory game bird ecologist for the Wisconsin DNR, Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, and current bird and habitat chief for Wisconsin DNR. And Kent is a, a great natural resource in and of itself to have uh, for the state, and has been a great supporter of UWSP, of course, and a personal friend of mine. And when we put this together, we wanted to have each one of the components of the NAWAP habitat, populations, and people. And Kent, right here in our own state, has been a real strong um, advocate and, and person working in with human dimensions and working with people. And we're really happy to have him here today and working with the Maywalk and those goals of the PhD. So please uh, join me in welcoming Kent Van Horn. Well, it's always, it's always nice to be on the other side. Um, for you students, I was you in these chairs a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> it was 30-some uh, years ago now. Um, <clears throat> and Dr. Thomas was a teenager then and, and was one of my professors <clears throat> and, and, and first taught me about uh, just working with people. Um, so that's where I started, was right where you are. Um, so. Um, it's always fun to see everything come f full circle um, and come back. Um, I want to, for those of you that are students, um, I know you're here at the university and you're um, taking all your ologies. Um, I had all the ologies, you know, mammalogy, ornithology, ichthyology, herbot, I did them all. And you fill your head with a lot of stuff. Um, but this is also a place where you need to get challenged a little bit in how you think about what you do and, and how we do what we do in this profession. So hopefully today um, I'm going to give you a little background and, and, and um, give you some information that maybe will challenge your thought processes about a few things. So that's, that's my, my, my hope here um, today. So. I know this has been a series, and all those folks up there are colleagues of mine. Um, I, I, I did note um, to Sharon that I think that this is almost an age trajectory here um, <laughs> along, along the seminar series. I am thankful I'm not the last speaker, so that means Kaminsky's older than I am. Um, but I, I'll remember, uh, uh, Dr. Mitch here, he, he was, uh, when I first started as the waterfowl biologist in Wisconsin, he was a, about 16 years old and already doing research on SCOP and was already twice as smart as I am <clears throat> as a scientist and now he's even smarter doing with his PhD and, and being a professor at Missouri where I went to graduate school. So it's, anyway, it's good to see all these folks. Um, so I know they've given you a lot of uh, really good information on the background of waterfowl and wetland management. So if you've been to any of these prior to today, I guess I just want to start out by saying so what have you learned so far about what we need to know to manage wetlands and waterfowl? Tell me something you've learned from the folks that have spoke so far. How many waterfowl there are. Okay, population data. What else did we learn? Come on now, you've got to learn something from all those smart people. The most difficult part is dealing with people. What else did you learn? Did you learn that yet? Did they talk about that? Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. So who was last week? Heath. Heath? Oh, very good. 
What else? Okay, very good. And in general, the better condition of the habitats are, the better populations are more Okay, habitat's a driver for, for populations. Very good. Anything else? So I like, when I come in on a series like this, I just like to hear a little bit of what you've taken away now so I can connect the dots, you know, as we move along um, here. So, question for you then is, population information on waterfowl, habitat work for waterfowl, who cares? Why? Why do you take a wetlands course? Why do you take ornithology? Why does somebody pay Patrice to work at the Mead Wildlife Area? Who cares? Hunters care. Hunters care because they benefit, they get to recreate and gain a resource. I was going to say uh, bird watchers and the general public as well uh, when seeing uh, birds or you know mallards and parks or so they get to view wildlife. Okay. Some of the stuff that you've heard so far, <clears throat> there's a lot of money and time and resources put into collecting population data, managing wetlands, protecting wetlands, <clears throat> and. All that's going on because somebody places a value on that. Most, you know, I, again, I was sitting where you are. Most of us think not the outdoors is cool. We think ducks are cool. We think birds, wildlife, we enjoy that stuff. We, we are attracted to it either because we hunt or because we like to be outdoors or we, we find it interesting. But the duck doesn't pay you to do any of the work you've heard to date. People do. And if they don't place a value on the resource in such a way as to provide the funding, because we only, we put our money right where we value something. Um, if they don't have a value on it and translate that into paying for it, then there's no point in doing any of the stuff that you've heard before so far. There's no point in having population data, right? We have an annual estimate of ducks across North America. Do we have an annual estimate of robins? Do we have a North American squirrel management plan? Okay, so so the point is, is there's, and, and, and I'm, I'm telling you, on a daily basis, more people look at squirrels than they do ducks. All right? I, I can pretty confidently say that. But there's, a, there's a, a, a background and a context where people have placed a value on these things, and that's why we do what we do in, in this profession. So I'm going to go through a little bit of this um, today. Um, so... Uh, Dr. Straub asked me, what did I want to call this talk today? And I, I wasn't sure, so I said, waterfall and wetland management, knowing what my colleagues had said before me, and, and how do people fit into that? And so I'm going to do a couple things. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a, just a few principles uh, of, of engaging people um, in, in, our, in our management of shared resources. And that's a critical thing. If we're managing natural resources, and particularly wildlife in North America, um, our, our culture and our laws set the fact that that's a shared resource, right? Um, and because it's a shared resource, um, you know, we, we, we have to help people know how to share and how, much, how many pieces of pie there are so we know how to share it and, and we work with them on that. And so um, some principles about that. A little history uh, of, of how people in process got us where we are to, today. Over the last hundred years, a lot of key things have happened that set the stage for where we are based upon laws and decisions that people made along the way. 
and then give you some examples um, at a national, state, and local level um, where we've um, engaged the public to help us guide the decisions that we make for managing wetlands and waterfowl. So if uh, some of you were in Dr. Sartini's class uh, last semester, you, you saw this slide before. When I talk about um, public involvement, there's three pillars that I always talk about. All right? So it's purpose, people, and process. The first thing you have to know is I have, I have a job I'm doing on a daily basis. Why do I want to engage people in it? What, what would be the purpose of a public involvement can, uh, process? What is the purpose of a survey of users? What is, what is my purpose for doing it? Because if you don't have an objective for why you're doing it, you're not going to get what you want. So the first thing is you have to understand your purpose. Who I am I? What am I getting paid to do today? And what, why do I want to get human dimensions data in the first place? And second, then, you have to understand in what you do, who are the key people? We often think about the fact that we need to have the users, the customers, information. But you also have to understand who are the decision makers. Are you collecting information to make a decision or just to know your customer base? You, and you, then you have to know who makes the decision and the process for that. So there's, you need to know who your pro and con people are. And once you've identified your purpose and the people that you need to learn about, then you develop a process and clearly communicate it so that you can engage people. So some examples in the waterfall and wetland world. So if you're at the federal level, what is your purpose? If you're a federal migratory game bird biologist, your purpose is primarily to manage a population of d d ducks for sustainable hunting. That's what most of the federal biologists are engaged in. At some level, that's their job. At the state level, while we're certainly providing a sustainable resource for migratory birds and waterfowl, it's also to provide um, hunting opportunities consistent with migration and habitat. The ducks aren't going to be around Wisconsin the same time they are around Louisiana. And the habitats are different. Hunting blue wing teal in Burnett County is different than hunting scop on the Bay of Green Bay. So part of a state biologist's job is to structure things to accommodate for those different opportunities. And at the property level, it's to provide that habitat that attracts ducks and provide a, an accessible place for people to hunt and view waterfall. So at each level, so we could say, well, we want to know what duck hunters want. Well, it depends upon who you are and what your purpose is to determine what it is you need to know. Because each of those levels have different jobs. So that's just an example. So who is your customer? Hint, it's not the ducks, right? We, we spend a lot of time studying wetlands, a lot of time studying ducks. But again, the customer, the reason you're doing it in the first place, is a person. Somebody that places a value on those things. You need to know who makes decisions or sets the sideboards. If you're a manager of a public waterfall area, somebody's going to put sideboards on you. They're going to tell you what your budget is what your work priorities are. And you may look at the landscape and think X, Y, and Z needs to be done. But if you can't translate what you see and what the customer wants so that the decision makers that set your sideboards understand that, then you're not going to get anywhere. You need to know up front as you work with people, sort of, OK, these, what are the different range of issues out there? Who's Who's on this side? Who's on this side? Who's going to oppose each other? Who's going to agree? Um, and um, when a decision then is made or a project is initiated, who will support and partner? So it's not only about what do people want, but what, do people willing, what are they willing to commit? What partner organizations are willing to step up and, and, and walk with you through whatever process or decision that you make? So again, process, once you know your purpose and your people, you, that helps you define the process to either gather information or involve people in decisions. Um, and it's key to note at the beginning of any process that you engage the public to let them know, are you just collecting information? 
or are you engaging them in a decision or in a recommendation? Because if you go out and collect information and people think that they're engaged in making a decision and you're just collecting information, they're going to be upset at the end. So you need to make it very clear up front what it is that you're doing. And then you need to, to um, define and communicate that process clearly and use multiple uh, methods, that would probably be a better word there, in the process. Because uh, we were talking with some students upstairs before and they were asking me some things. And uh, For example, you can do a, a mail survey of a user group and you can get different information about what proportion of people think this or want this, but you don't always know why. Why do they want that? And so you need a different method of engaging the public than a survey to find out the why do you want that. And that's where you engage in things like focus groups or talking to groups or having meetings because that's where you get to dialogue with and listen to people and find out the why bef behind what they want. And just knowing that whatever, uh, all the duck hunters in northern Wisconsin want to start the duck hunting season as early as possible doesn't tell you why they want it. Do they want it because it freezes up early? Do they want it because the blueing teal migrate? You need to know the why. So you need to have these different ways of engaging the public so you put together the complete picture. So I'm going to give you a little history here. Um, and I want you to grasp. Um, I, I'm amazed sometimes now as I step back and I look back at 30 years of my career <clears throat> and, I, and I, as I've been involved in other things the rest of my life, I'm, I'm involved in um, other things helping our community and working with the poor and, and dealing with other, other things in our social world. And as I step back and look at 30 years in, in waterfall and wetland management, I am amazed really at the scope of resources that goes into this. It's, it's huge. The, the, the complexity of international and national and state law and the resources that go into managing waterfowl and wetlands is huge when you look at all the other things that go on out here in the world. Um, uh, so in this context that we're currently in, it's an international issue. Federal laws drive much of our management in the US on various levels. Significant resources are committed to monitoring and setting regulations. Um, and there's significant uh, habitat funding programs at all levels. So how did we get there? How, how did that we get into this context? Well, if we look back briefly, a little bit of history here, you look back and you see the European colonization in North America. And they came here and they saw an abundance that they, they just hadn't seen in, in their continent. And, and during the 1800s, there was just this time of they just encountered abundance after abundance as they moved across North America and it seemed limitless and they exploited that in in many ways from from trees to to harvesting wildlife to lots of things and so all that was going on before anybody really thought about well how many how much resources out there and how much are we using it's just every time you turned around another corner it seemed like there was an abundance of what you had to encounter and as you can see this is a picture of market hunting of, of, of waterfowl. And so there were a few, of course, out there that were interested in natural resources and were monitoring um, birds in particular. And these are some of those individuals. One of them um, in particular, and these are folks that were good naturalists that documented different things. Uh, th but this gentleman right here uh, was noted because he crossed a couple of different um, social realms. Um, he edited the field and stream and, and worked with <clears throat> the hunting community. Uh, he also helped establish some major um, birding organizations over time but, and, <clears throat> and he was a scientist and so he helped bring all of these folks together on some of the to this realization that there was a, a, a resource that we'd hit some limit on an ability to sustain the kind of lifestyle and use that we were having of at least the bird resource. And that's all great when you have scientists um, and uh, people that can lead in writing publications and letting know about what's going on, but unless you have people that are leaders and can influence policy and decisions, you know, it's just a lot of um, 
you know, generating one more scientific journal, right? Um, so you can get tenure or something. Um, so, uh, but until you get somebody that can make decisions and have an influence, you don't really accomplish anything. And so fortunately, we had a president who, who loved to hunt and to be out, outdoors uh, that moved into uh, a place of influence. And this is key because um, President Roosevelt, along with some other variables, which I'll talk about in a minute, brought wildlife conservation into the world of the federal government. And up until that time, it was there either wasn't any rule or law, or it was under the jurisdiction of the state. And obviously, when you're talking about birds, migratory birds, that doesn't work very well because they move between states and between countries. And so this was really uh, a critical piece here that brought that. And what you'll see when you look at the history of conservation is that the initiative that brought um, conservation to the federal level, and, and my premise here is that it was brought there primarily because of migratory birds, that initiated a whole bunch of other federal level wildlife conservation efforts that uh, progressed over the decades from there because it opened the door to the federal government being involved. So we started out earlier talking about the fact that who cares? Well someone has to place a value on things. So there were things going on that people had some value on. There was that affected migratory birds. There was the the feather collection, and um, there was market hunting, and um, some smart people brought in the fact that uh, insect eating birds um, are probably good for agriculture. That was a nice coup to move that in there to connect the conservation of birds with an economic reality. Again, there has to be a tie. You have to be able to tie the conservation effort to something that people place a value on. And so <clears throat> all this stuff was beginning to emerge in the early 1900s and bringing that awareness up. Here, this hit on some emotion. Um, the ladies really loved the, the pretty hats. But then when some folks went to where they were killing the birds, herons and egrets on the nest uh, to get those pretty feathers, that, that hit people. They, they, it hit them here and they, they they, um, they had a problem with that. There, there was a sort of an ethical issue that was raised <clears throat> in addition to economics. So people play, have values that are ethical, values that are economic, but they have to connect to those with the resource in order for there to be a value. So a number of things started happening then. So in 1900, <clears throat> the first federal protection law um, was init initiated to prohibit interstate shipping and commerce of Ill illegally taken birds. So look at that first bullet up there. <clears throat> Why could the federal government get involved at that point? Any, can anybody tell me? Why? What did, what, at that po point in our country's history, what did the federal government have generally accepted authority over that a state didn't? Exactly, interstate commerce. So a lot of the wildlife protection was based in the jurisdiction of the state, but when something moved between states, then it became under the jurisdiction of the federal government. So our, our smart former colleagues figured out that <clears throat> market hunting crossed state lines so they could draw the federal government in with the Lacey Act because it could regulate that because it was interstate commerce and they could offer some limits on market hunting. So um, while on paper that was good, in reality it didn't do a whole lot, but it started, it opened the door. Again, critical piece that it opened the door to federal government involvement. And then um, there was another bill that was um, about all about bird protection in 1913. What's important about this one though is that it was challenged in court and declared unconstitutional that the federal government 
went beyond its authority <clears throat> in regulating um, the, the, the take and use of birds because again that was associated with state authority <clears throat> and so that effort sort of stalled and failed so then again how do you bring the federal government into it and again if you're gonna conserve a migratory bird that crosses state and and national lines you can't do that just as a state law you have to bring the federal government in so how do we bring the federal government in the federal government had accepted authority over things that moved between states and the federal government represented the United States with other countries so the so while this failed as a federal law this allowed it to succeed because no one would dispute that the federal government had authority to create to agree to a treaty right an individual state couldn't establish a treaty with another government only the federal government could so by establishing a migratory bird treaty that established the federal authority over migratory birds and then that was f uh, followed by the federal law that implemented the provisions to protect migratory birds um, and uh, yes Every national meeting that I go to, that tension is still there. <laughs> Every wildlife issue. Who's in charge, the feds or the state? And uh, as an example, when the Democrats are in, they usually appoint somebody to be the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service who has a federal view. When the Republicans are in, they usually appoint the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and their name is circulating right now. Uh, who has a state view, in other words, who has been a director of state agencies so that they will have a better uh, relationship with the states. So it, it's very interesting. It even plays out in who's getting appointed to major positions in Washington, D.C., that issue. Thank you. And, that, and, and all of this is critical <coughs> to the conservation of migratory birds and as we'll see in a minute subsequent wildlife conservation work not to you know ding our biological profession but none of that has to do with biological data okay biological data didn't drive all this now granted those naturalists you know raised the flag and said hey we have a declining population we have a problem but somebody didn't come and present a biological graph and say here's an issue and then they passed a federal law it had to work through all of these human issues about about jurisdiction and authority and what value we place on these animals and again the drivers if you remember for um, protecting migratory birds through these steps was not robins it wasn't cardinals I mean how many people look at cardinals in their backyard but that isn't what drove this what drove this is um, we hunt ducks and because we hunt ducks we place a value on them we um, we want agriculture and reduced crop damage and at this time we know that these birds eat those nasty things that eat our crops so that's a good thing so there was an economic value there was a value that people were able to place on things that drove a lot of these steps so after the migratory bird treaty and the migratory bird treaty act it still wasn't settled that again got challenged in court <laughs> about the federal government overstepping its jurisdiction and then finally in 1920 there was a supreme court ruling that that settled the whole thing. It established that yes, in fact, migratory birds are, un, are, are under the authority of the federal government because they move between countries and between states. And those premises set up the federal government to be in charge. You're but, chuckling. Yeah, because the comment of one federal official uh, one day to me was they knew that it was settled with the Appomattox Courthouse. <laughs> 
you, you, you can write your history any way you want. This is Kent's history today. <laughs> well, I didn't say I agree. Yeah, I know, I know. So um, hopefully there's not a history professor in here that's going to challenge me on my, on my accuracy. But this is totally from a bird guy. So the cool thing about this is that initial treaty um, between the United States and Great Britain on behalf of Canada then led to uh, an expansion over the decades of the Migratory Bird Treaty into other countries with Mexico um, and Russia and Japan uh, recognizing the movement of birds um, between all of these countries. And so there's basic um, international agreements on the protection of these birds. And so the result is we have over a thousand species of migratory birds that then are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. <coughs> um, Non-game and game and harvested species. And those federal authority then sets up certain sideboards um, about um, permitting hunting under certain regulations, um, transport, uh, not no hunting during the breeding season, um, et cetera. Not no market hunting. It establishes certain parameters under federal law based upon the principles of that treaty. So then states then have to, state laws have to function within these sideboards. So with all of that work that was done of getting people to agree and, and negotiating laws and policy and getting the protection in, in, in place, we protected the bird and the bird population. But we all know that the habitat drives the population. So we've protected the birds, so what about the habitat? Well again, because we opened the door to federal involvement, that opened the door not just to the protection of migratory birds, but now we could protect the habitat that supports the migratory bird. And of course, habitat doesn't move between states, but now we've opened the door to where the federal government can be involved in conservation. So we began uh, the establishment of refuges um, through the federal government. And then we encountered a huge uh, drought and the duck hunters saw that what happens when we lose habitat, then we lose the resource that flies in that they're used to seeing. And so that then led to, okay, well, now we've got the connection. We protected the birds, we liked the birds, now we need the habitat. So we need an established funding source to protect the habitat. And this was huge that we implemented a federal hunting license, if you will, with the migratory bird stamp. Again, that's a pretty huge thing because all that jurisdiction, if you look at across all the other game species, it's all at the state jurisdiction level. It's not at the federal level. So this was a big step. Interestingly enough, because of migratory birds and the legal status that allowed us to say that that's a natural resource that is under federal jurisdiction because it moves across countries and states, it opened the door to federal involvement in conservation. And then we end up with a federal tax on firearms that provi provides a, a huge funding base to states to protect all the other wildlife that don't move between states. And that's a really huge thing. I don't, in my premise here is this never, I don't believe this ever would have happened if migratory birds hadn't kicked open the door of federal involvement. This would have never happened. And again, if you're not familiar with this, it's a tax um, on firearms and ammunition that's a, a federal tax that then is, is funneled back to the states based upon the number of hunters that we have in the state. And that's some pretty big dollars that have helped for wildlife conservation. All right, so then that established the flyway system. And I'm leading up to something here in the waterfall world. So this established the flyway system by which we collected data and established our hunting regulations on migratory birds. And these states within each of these flyways are a flyway council. And they serve as an administrative uh, group that advises the federal government on hunting regulations. And so we got into this world now where um, it was a federal state system of biological monitoring, 
annually establishing hunting regulations and tracking hunter numbers. And so this all developed there in, in, the, in the 30s and the 40s that we now have this really complex system um, of monitoring migratory birds that are hunted and regulating harvest. And so for about 40 years, we thought we had it all figured out. You got good habitat, drives populations. If you got good habitat, water's up, ducks are up, then you can liberalize your regs. That produces high hunter numbers. That produces lots of money with stamps and licenses and funding for habitat. So then you have good habitat and, and lots of ducks. And life is good, right? So what I just described for you is this era. Breeding ducks is red, duck sam stales a measure of hunter numbers is blue. When duck numbers are up, hunter numbers are up. When ducks go down, hunter numbers go down. And everything matches, right? Or not. So for about 40 years, that matched really well. And then somewhere in the 1990s, the duck numbers went back up and the hunter numbers didn't. So all of these wetland and waterfall managers said, whoa, wait a minute. This nice little cycle that we had isn't working. We got lots of ducks. We get, the habitat's good, so we got lots of ducks, but now we don't have enough hunters. They're not growing with the ducks, which means our funding is not going to grow, which means we're not going to be able to maintain that good habitat into the future. So, all these folks like myself said, hmm, what are we going to do? Well, that changed our way of thinking. So, one of the things that happened during that 40 years is that many of the waterfowl managers, of course, were also duck hunters, and so they just figured everybody thinks like us. And so, if there's lots of ducks, everybody wants to go hunt, right? Everybody thinks like us, and so we made decisions based on, the, on what we thought, and that pattern of time. Well, when the populations of ducks and duck hunters separated, all of a sudden we said, well, maybe everybody doesn't think like us. Something else is going on. And so we need to understand the hunter attitudes and motivations, and that's what drove it to us to that point, and that's when you started to see the North American Waterfall Management Plan and everything else begin to emerge is like, okay, this isn't as simple as we thought it was. We got to start figuring out what we're doing. So, in 2005, we designed the 2005 National Duck Hunter Survey. This was the first one of this type. And what was really interesting at this point, not only did the separation of duck numbers and hunter numbers create this, but there was a number of influential old-time waterfowl managers that were concerned about the liberal re regulations under those high duck numbers and they came in and said, no nah, man, you, you gotta shorten the duck pot season and you gotta reduce the bag limit or, or the world is gonna crash sometime in the future. You, you gotta do that. And they were having an influence because we had no human dimensions data to say otherwise. And we had always concluded as waterfowl managers that everybody thinks like us. All of our customers think like us, and so we can just do what we think is best. So, we kind of reacted in defense to that and created this uh, survey. And so the purpose was prim primarily focused on deciding season length and bag limit and its relationship to hunter motivation. That was the purpose of the survey. And what we wanted to do was influence wildlife officials at the state and federal level and also understand hunters. So we had a national mail survey stratified by geographic area, by flyway and then north and south, on recognizing that maybe not all hunters think alike. So what did we learn from that national survey? Well, about 60% of the people said that they, they thought the season length was about right. So those few in influential people that said we should sort, shorten it um, didn't agree with the majority. And 72% thought the bag limit was about right. So the majority of the duck hunters didn't necessarily agree with those influential duck managers um, but we also saw that there were some significant differences. Now, granted, um, th those are, there's different season lengths. The season length in the Atlantic Flyway. Oop, this is supposed to be Pacific Flyway over here, sorry. Um, 
across flyways is different, but the attitudes of the hunters also differed. So again, we couldn't just sit there in a the room and say, well, all duck hunters think X. They think different things in different parts of the country. And even within a flyway, so within the Mississippi flyway, when we asked bag limit and season length, um, you see that in the middle of the flyway, so Illinois, Missouri, states like that, most people were pretty happy with the bag limit. But when you went into the lower Mississippi flyway, it was considerably fewer. So even within our own flyway, everybody didn't think the same thing. So we began to learn stuff that we didn't know before. Um, and the other thing that we needed to recognize is that when we collect data at a national scale, um, it may be l not work at smaller scales. Um, and the question then is, the other thing we learned from this that we didn't really set out to learn, but what we learned is that these regulations that we sweat and worry about actually weren't driving the motivation for the hunters. We thought if the season length is longer, more people will hunt. If the bag limit's higher, more people will hunt. And what we figured out is that wasn't the case at all. So we're like, huh. All right, so the National Survey kind of gave us a, it wasn't designed to find that, but some of the data suggested that. So then we took that to this more local state level because, again, our data suggested that hunters in different places have different motivations. So here in Wisconsin, we've done waterfowl hunter mail surveys every two years since 2007. And so we looked at some of the things we decided at the state level. And again, our purpose here is hunting opportunity and when hunters want that opportunity. Um, we wanted to know the people involved are waterfowl hunters, also hunting organizations, because remember, sometimes the organizations make a statement that's influential. It doesn't necessarily, necessarily represent all the hunters, right? Uh, administrators and elected officials that were making decisions on regulations and funding, things like that. So our process was both a state mail survey, stratified by zone, combined with public and group meetings. So I did those different levels of involvement. What, this is an interesting piece, and I'm just giving you like one snippet of each level as an example. We gave them 20 attributes, 20 different attributes of what is your most, what is most important to a good waterfowl hunt, right? And we included things like you harvested a duck, that's important. Filling your bag, getting six ducks in a day. A specific species, I shot a canvas bag. None of those ranked high. Look at, these were the, and, and they kind of broke out in groups. So these were the top six. Not losing a crippled bird, not, no conflicts with hunters, being with family and friends, seeing lots of ducks and geese, not feeling crowded, passing on a tradition. Four of the six were social. They didn't have anything to do with duck populations. They didn't have anything to do with habitat. They had to do with social issues. So these things that were motivating the hunters, now granted, they want to see ducks out there. They didn't necessarily have to shoot one to end the day feeling okay. But as long as they saw them, they, they knew that you know, there was, there's ducks out there. So that, that was good enough. But the main drivers that motivated somebody to go duck hunting had a lot more to do with people than they did with ducks. And so at a national level, we're putting all this time and resources into monitoring populations and, and wrangling over regulations. And all of a sudden, our human dimensions data says, you know what, ain't that important. You can make this, the season length 80 days instead of 60, and it's probably not going to change the number of people that participate. So this challenged a lot of our thought process. And so we learned this, some things here, and it was really good. Um, so that things like season schedule zones, bag limits, they were OK. People were satisfied with what they had. But satisfaction was driven, again, by these social factors more than anything else. So how did we respond to some of that? Well, one of the things they told us is what really makes a, sh a hunt unpalatable is if I wing a bird, I injure a bird, you know, I don't retrieve a bird, right? So we initiated wing shooting clinics to help people shoot better and better understand how to harvest a bird successfully. 
We reviewed rule and law authority to reduce crowding and conflict. Now in the state of Wisconsin, we have some limitations there. Um, and we looked for ways to focus on relationships and mentors in our hunter ed. A lot of our hunter ed for a long time was really focused on safety, which is good, <coughs> and identification of species, which is good. Um, but most of what we were doing was sort of educating the choir um, on how to sing. We weren't really connecting with social units. So now our folks that are leading some of our um, hunter recruitment are looking at actually focusing on recruiting the moms. And then once you get the mom into hunting, you get the whole family in because those relationships are really important to the motivation to go hunting. So we're making some changes in how we look at some of these things. Now here in the state of Wisconsin, we're kind of limited. In other states, they have what's called a managed hunt where you can um, limit the number of waterfowl hunters on a property. And so you can reduce crowding and reduce hunting pressure. And under Wisconsin law, we can't do that. Um, so that's a little bit of a limitation on our, on our point. So we try to get creative. But those data at the state level drove us to realize that all, some of the key things that we can do to motivate people about waterfowl hunting and provide a satisfy, satisfying experience actually need to occur at the state level, not the federal level or the state level. And so at the property level, we want to provide a property-based duck hunting hunting that provides good experience, less conflict, reduces duck disturbance, so the ducks sit around. These are the folks we have to influence. And so <clears throat> we, um, this is a, an example from Mead. So what did we do? We initiated a hunter workshop, annual hunter meetings, and survey cards. So this is an example from the staff at Mead. They held a, a meeting with the local waterfowl hunters and said, well, what do you think? How could we improve, uh, improve waterfowl hunting on this property. And they came up with lots of ideas and they related to some of the things we learned in the statewide survey. That they wanted less conflict, less crowding, and they wanted to make sure the property held birds. And they came up with a variety of ideas about how to do that. And again, under our laws, we could implement some of those and, and not others. Um, but we got creative um, and so these are some of the things they learned. The hunters wanted hunter numbers controlled. Um, they believed that the early season, so like the early goose season before the duck opener disturbed the marsh. Um, and they also believed that the ducks needed more resting time and area so they're not driven off the property. We had the habitat, but after the hunting season started, all the ducks ran off, right? So that's what we learned. And so what, how did we respond? Well. We went through a rule process and eliminated the early goose season because that's what the hunters on that property felt was important to improve their hunting experience. Um, again, we were unable to restrict the hunter numbers because of state law, but we were able to enlarge the refuge areas. So enlarge the areas where there was and reduce disturbance to hold the ducks. And we put in an afternoon shooting hour closure for the first part of the duck season so that the number of hours the ducks were shot at was reduced. So again, this, we were spending a lot of time and effort at this level, but when we got the human dimensions data, it drove us on a whole different tra trajectory of where to put our time and effort to improve the waterfowl hunting experience and motivate people to waterfowl hunt. Um, so that's, I just kind of wanted to give you a couple little snippets of examples at a, at a national and a state level and about how when we look at what people are thinking and, and use different methods to get at what people are motivated by, it can change our whole management scenario and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and, so, and again, those are just, I could give you a hundred examples, those are just a few. Um, but again, remember, it's about the people. And if you want to engage people and find out some of the information we found out, you need to start with a clear purpose. Who am I? Am I a local manager like Patrice? Am I a state waterfowl biologist like I used to be? Who am I? What's my responsibility? And what do I need to know from people? And who do I need to either collect data from or involve in a decision process and influence? Who, who's going to make the ultimate decision on you know, whether I get funding for a wing shooting clinic, right? Things like that. Who's going to make that decision? So I have to know who I'm going to influence 
and I know, have to know who I'm going to serve. And then I have to develop a good process that's clear to engage people and get the information I need to make decisions. So um, that's what I have to offer you today. Hopefully I, I, I gave you some things different to think about. Um, and uh, I'll take any questions. And I'm glad Patrice was here, so she Thanks, could Kent. she could show how I'm praising the Mead staff. Yes, <laughs> we miss you. We had to come visit. Bill says hi. Okay, good. <laughs> yes. Uh, is this people element uh, permeating the, the North American whole the whole plan, the <coughs> states and the, the larger plan, or is it hard? Well, so. You, it started with that 2005 duck hunter survey, right? And then as we began, went, started to go through these revisions of the North American plan, um, the, the duck hunter survey said, hey, you guys, there's things here you guys don't understand. We realized we needed to know more about people because of the divergence of duck populations and hunter numbers. So then we had a, uh, a waterfowl hunter summit in 2007. I think it was. It was after we got the survey data and we saw it, we got slapped in the face with the reality of this divergence. And so we got all the waterfowl managers, state and federal from around the country and we got them all together in Minneapolis and we had this big summit and we talked about what to do next and all this. And one of the results of that was the next time we revise the North American Waterfowl Management Plan, we need to figure out how to incorporate people into this. Because it had always been about, you know, habitat harvest, you know, but we hadn't, you know, man monitoring harvest, looking at regulations, protecting habitat. We figured, you know, that's going to be the driver, right? If you got habitat, you got ducks, you got hunters. Well, so then we're like, oh, that ain't working anymore. So now we have as a major pillar of the North American Waterfall Plant 2012 revision, incorporating collecting hunter and other w wetland user data into our decision process. And, and we're still learning about how we want to incorporate that information actually into our decisions. We're just still learning how to get it. I don't think we've got a good mechanism to get that, at least at the federal level. I think it, here in Wisconsin at the state level, you know, not to be prideful, I think we have a good system for incorporating the human uh, element into our decision process. But at least I worked hard on that for 12 years, so. So, yeah, maybe you know, to follow that up, um, one big emphasis right now is to, because of the loss of financial support that's been going on with some of the loss of hunter numbers, a big push is to try to bring non-hunters who are still, who still consider themselves conservationists and are conservationists, but don't maybe, they, they maybe don't participate in the traditional way of buying a duck stand, mm -hmm. um, or through the Hidden Robertson funds. You know, just what's your opinion or what's your, you know, can you comment on how we can bring that, that group into the fold and cohesively, maybe in Wisconsin and as a And forgive me for sitting, but I, I, I fell down the stairs and twisted my knees two weeks ago, so I can only stand for so long. <laughs> I was moving my 18-year-old out of an apartment and fell down the stairs with a box. Um, so, so at this point, my knee is throbbing. Um, but, uh, and again, I gave you some examples I'm most familiar with that are related to duck hunters. I, there's also some parallel examples I could given, have given you with the way we're looking at and trying to collect data on other people that value wetlands and, and use our waterfall areas, and I, I, didn't, I didn't share those examples. Um, I think um, we're seeing a challenge there about the fact that the structure that I provided for you and showed you the, the history, right, is really based a lot around the game species and the data and the effort into monitoring those. And so we've got a dynamic going right now is, um, do we get people that don't hunt ducks, that aren't non-consumptive users, do we get them to buy into our existing system or do we have to just step out of that box altogether and think differently? 
And I think those in the waterfall management community are still struggling back and forth. It's been on the listserv for the last two weeks, a national dialogue listserv of waterfall managers about, about that very thing. Which way do we go? And I, don't, I, don't, I think you can see if you read those, uh, Dr. Straub, that, that we're not on the same page about whether we should do that or not. Um, one of the things that I'll bring us all the way back to the beginning on is who cares? I can sit here and say wetlands are important and I, I want to convince you that they're important but somebody pays my salary and tells me what to do based upon their values. Uh, going to these two issues, uh, the, the alternative funding issue has always, always for my whole career been a big discussion on both the federal and the state level. At the federal level it has failed time after time. But in some states it has succeeded. The most recently was Iowa, like mm -hmm. a week or so ago with their I Will uh, program that got signed into law and before that Minnesota. And going to Kent's discussion, the citizens of Minnesota and Iowa said, we care about water. Water, we drink it, we, we wash with it, yep. we like to look at it. You know, water was the thing that galvanized the citizens of two states to set up alternative funding, not tied to funding for natural resources. Yep. So somebody cared right. about water. And that's where some of you come in. And again, what Dr. Thomas is getting back to that really beginning point is they have to have a personal value on it. You know, 80 years ago, somebody had a personal value on a wetland because they had a memory of how dad took me duck hunting there and they walked home with a duck and so they they had a connection to that right we're obviously a little disconnected when you turn on the faucet and get clean water people don't connect that with a wetland very often and so that is part of our job as natural resource professionals is to one understand that connection and be able to educate people because it's because we do know people care about clean water but they don't necessarily understand where it comes from I can tell you I lived in Florida for eight years and the peninsula of Florida <clears throat> is surrounded by salt water and there's a freshwater lens that sits under the ground and the Everglades and all these wetlands feed that freshwater lens and all the citizens draw out of that fresh water from their wells. Problem is, every time another house is built in South Florida, we drain another acre of wetlands. And we take that fresh water and we dump it in the ocean so that we can build our house, but then that house needs water. And so we were in this critical dynamic. I lived in the city of Jupiter. We had 21 municipal wells. 10 of the 21 drew brackish water from underground and had to go to a desalinization plant and then they mixed it with the fresh water from the other 10 wells before it came to your faucet. People got to understand that <laughs> if they're going to value wetlands. Very good. Um, well, we do have, well actually I have one more comment to make just to add this and then yeah. we have a reception out in the hall where we can gather and have some more questions but one thing that I'd like to add to this is sometimes uh, I've struggled to kind of uh, visualize how, when we go through the waterfall management plan strategically, how social data would enter the equation and how that would look on, on a map, for instance. And one, one way that we're actually doing this now, and I think this is a real concrete example we can kind of relate to, historically, or even before 2012 in the North American Waterfall Management we prioritize landscapes basically based on their capability to support waterfowl, breeding waterfowl populations. So we had like maybe a map of Wisconsin, and southeastern Wisconsin always rose to the top because there was a lot of grassland and wetlands. We're changing our thinking there now, and we're actually, one potential way of doing this is saying, okay, these wetlands that are near urban areas, so there's like a boundary around an urban area, we know that not only is there wetland benefits around an urban area, but 
people that are here in urban area are more likely to visit these. We're starting to change the weight or change that landscape to say, hey look, this wetland that's maybe near Milwaukee or near Green Bay, you know, let's put some priority there because there's a lot of conservationists, users, hunters, and not hunters that can get to these wetlands easier. So that landscape is no longer just driven by, you know, habitat only. It's driven by this user interface and like closer to populated areas where people can see these benefits. And that's a big change from where it was historically just based on birds. So that's one way that human dimensions data is kind of changing where we prioritize wetland work. So um, thank you again, Ken. Appreciate it.